Greetings. Welcome to online worship at Mount Olive Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Glenn Munson, one of the pastors here at Mount Olive. And on behalf of the whole staff and the congregation of Mount Olive, welcome. And especially if you are a first time worshiper. And God bless you in your worship today. Worship today begins with a newly written order for confession and forgiveness entitled, A Prayer for Turning. In this confession, you are invited to join us in confessing that we all, both knowingly and unknowingly, are participants in the institutional sin of racism. We know this is difficult work, and we know that this will be difficult to do today, but we encourage you to join into it with an open heart as a beginning point for our healing of ourselves and our nation. We also invite you to continue to uh, give gifts towards the support of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Minneapolis through Mount Olive, where good work in racial justice is being done even today. You will see more on that in the website or the bulletin. Now as the prelude uh, begins, we invite you to light a candle, to find some small bit of bread and cracker or wine or juice for the Holy Communion, which we will serve later in the service. So now we prepare ourselves for worship. Let us confess together the institutional sin of racism in which each of us is daily immersed. We pray. Most merciful God, we confess we are powerless over our society's sin and cannot free ourselves. We confess that we live in a nation that systematically prioritizes the safety, freedom, comfort, and wealth of white people over black, indigenous, and people of color. We confess that white people continually benefit from this system, while black, indigenous, and people of color continually suffer. We confess that our society's unfair institutions keep us from enjoying full and loving relationships with our neighbors. We confess defensiveness, confusion, anger, or fear to speak of these things. We confess that we do not always expect that a meaningful change is possible. We are dismayed to be part of our society's sin, and we sadly repent. We beg forgiveness from you, dear God. We beg forgiveness from our neighbors. Help us now. Help us turn away from the oppressive system of racism and turn toward justice and love.
people of God, a life in Christ means a call to radical love. In the Gospels, Jesus commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves and to give up wealth, power, and privilege in order to follow this way. And so, in our life in Christ, we not only confess our participation in sin, but we steer hard away from it and begin a new way. Let us speak together our repentance. For the healing of our world, and for the sake of Jesus Christ, we turn away from our country's unjust system of power and turn toward God's system of justice and compassion. We work to liberate ourselves from the institutional racism in which we are entangled, and we embed ourselves in God's way of freedom. We commit to learning about racial inequality. We commit to overturning the tables of unfair systems we have lived with for so long. And through study, conversation, and action, we commit to break down racial injustice in our own congregation and in the larger church. Held in God's unfailing love, we repent. People of God, hear this good word. Through the love of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and are now present to make things right. Go with courage to make mistakes. Go with grace to take bold risks. Go empowered to do your part for change and return again and again for refreshment and strength. People of God, you belong to Christ. Change the world. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, 
we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree where they ate. Then he said to them, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due, due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hello friends. In Psalm 116, the psalmist tells this experience of having been at the end of their rope in deep trouble and then being rescued. And the psalmist gives all thanks and praise to God for being the one to rescue. It's really about gratitude. And in Psalm 116, the psalmist wonders how she can repay God for all the goodness that God has shown. I want to teach you the refrain, and we'll do that in parts. The first part goes like this. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. Your turn. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. Good. My turn. I call on her all day and every day. Together. I call on her all day and every day. My turn. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. My turn. I call on her all day and every day. Together. I call on her all day and every day. I'll sing it through once all together and then join me. I love the keeper of life. For she hears my cry, I call on her all day and every day. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry, I call on her all day and every day. Let's try that all together. I love the keeper of life, for she hears She hears my cry, 
I call on her all day and every day. Good. I've got some verses. How could I ever pay her back for all she's given to me? I'll lift up the cup of rescue now. Call her name as I look at I love the keeper. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. I call on her all day and every day. I love the keeper of life, for she hears my cry. I call on her all day and every day. My turn for a verse. Here I am, your servant, just like my mom before me. You freed me and smiled upon my life. So I make you this sacrifice, my gratitude, my gratitude. Here we go together. I love the keeper of life. She hears my cry I call on her All day and every day I love the keeper of life For she hears my cry I call on her All day and every day Last verse for me Oh, accept the vows I make now In front of this assembly in the center of this holy place In the midst of Jerusalem Hallelujah, hallelujah Here we go I love the keeper of life For she hears my cry I call on her all day and every day The Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. 
Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that person. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in the synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at the time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Before I begin, I want to thank Regina Seabrook for her insights as I prepared this sermon for this week. Without her voice, I fear I would just be one more privileged white male speaking into the midst of a situation that, as the Apostle Paul might say, I can see only as in a mirror dimly. Regina is a member here at Mount Olive, and she is also part of our Synod's community accompaniment table, which is currently doing a summer book study focused on better understanding evil. They are reading the book, Reviving Old Scratch, Demons and the Devil for Doubters and the Disenchanted by Richard Beck. And now, my sermon for this week. Crowds are complex creatures. At their best, they can be a wellspring of positive social energy. As a Slate article puts it, crowds are often highly supportive, altruistic, friendly, and often fun places to be. That collective energy of the audience singing along to the band's hit song at the concert, that feeling of being part of something bigger than yourself in the protest march or the crowdfunding campaign. And research suggests that this positive energy that we experience in these events leads to reduced anxiety and fewer reports of physical ailments, an effect that lasts for weeks after the event. But at their worst, crowds can be violent and riotous. There's usually a triggering event, an accident, an attack on the police, an attack by the police. And once triggered, a crowd can become a destructive force, overturning cars, burning down property, looting stores and businesses. Jesus notes these two natures of crowds in our gospel reading today. First, we are told that Jesus sees the crowd as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Having compassion on them, Jesus summons his disciples and sends them out, while describing the crowd in very different terms than he did before. I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. And so today I want to unpack four observations about this text and what it might mean for our life today, especially in light of recent events. First, Jesus sees the crowd in both sheepness and wolfness. As Luther might put it, we are simultaneously sheep and wolf. 
And how we see other people is the starting point for how we treat them. And Jesus challenges us to change our perceptions of victims and perpetrators. It is tempting to dismiss an angry crowd. They're criminals, they're delinquents, they're impulsive, they're unreasonable. But the people in an angry crowd aren't simply dumb sheeple, blindly following others. They're merely bolder and more strongly cooperative than they would be otherwise. As the psychologist Floyd Allport put it in 1924, an individual in a crowd behaves just as he would behave alone, only more so. To dismiss the crowd because of their behavior is to dehumanize them, which is precisely what Jesus avoids doing in our reading today. Jesus sees the crowd for the human beings that they are in all of their sheep and wolf glory. When we treat people as dumb sheeple or as outsiders, we are more likely to treat them in violent and cruel ways, in ways that violate our otherwise principled values of what is right and fair and just. And dehumanizing them prevents us from hearing what they have to say. We refuse to consider that they are right and we are wrong. We refuse to consider that they may see things that we don't or can't. In an interview with Chris Wallace in 1966, Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way. I contend that the cry of black power is, at bottom, a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. I think that we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. If we can step back from our self-righteousness and our arrogance even a little bit, we can begin to see in the angry crowd people who have tried all of the proper channels to vent their frustration and their grief and their outrage only to be dismissed at every turn. Think about it this way. Have you ever been in an active shooter situation or imagined what that situation would be like at your workplace or your spouse's workplace, your child's workplace, your child's school or your grandchild's school? Maybe you've lost a loved one in a mass shooting or know someone who has. Now, take that anxiety that despair, that outrage, that grief and anger, and imagine it flooding back every single time that you see a police car in traffic. Multiply that by a thousand, by 10,000, by a million or more. Lengthen it out over decades, generations. Take all of those people and put them in a collective mass, physically or online, where their emotion can fuel itself like a wildfire creating its own weather, amplifying its power. Is it any wonder then why that emotion might pour out, boil over into protests and riots and looting? So long as we continue to see protests and riots and looting as the diseases and not the symptoms, we will continue to misdiagnose the terminal illness of our culture, racism. And it is an illness that will continue to plague us long after we have been vaccinated against COVID-19. When the coronavirus death toll has finally been tallied, when a number has officially been stamped in our history books, racism will still be claiming life after life after life. To ignore the cries of the oppressed and to double down on the certainty of our own rightness is to remain complicit in and perpetuate the injustice or as the American management guru Russ Ackoff once put it, the writer we do the wrong thing, the wronger we become. Second, Jesus had compassion on the crowds. He didn't say, go be harassed and helpless someplace else, not in my backyard. No, he had compassion on them. But 
when we see the lost sheep of our own culture, we have the audacity to say, go over there, protest over there, and don't be angry and don't loot and don't riot. As the occupying people, as the oppressors, who are we to tell them what they should feel and how and where they should express it? Denying them the very expression of human emotion is to yet again dehumanize them while we continue to flaunt the symbols of our wealth and our freedom and our power, which we have forced them to build for us and which we have denied them ownership. Compassion is the minimum of what we owe for all that we have taken. Third, The presence of the wolves doesn't stop Jesus from sending the disciples out into the crowd. He doesn't tell them, stay home, it's too dangerous, it's not worth it. He doesn't say, keep your head down, don't rock the boat, don't speak out, don't make waves. He sends them out into the crowd with full disclosure of what lies before them. I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. This is an extension of Jesus' compassion on the people. The sending of the 12 is a direct response to it. We have reduced the word compassion to something akin to pity, but the word literally means to suffer with. When we talk about taking up our cross and following Christ, first we must find him. Where is he? How will we know him when we see him? Well, he is the scapegoat par excellence, the quintessential victim of state-sponsored violence. So that is where he shows up in our world, in the scapegoats of our culture, in the victims of state-sponsored violence. To take up Christ's cross is to take up their cross, to enter into their suffering, to be baptized into their deaths. We need eyes to see their grief, their outrage, their anger, not as forces of destruction, but as invitations to sit with them in their suffering, to learn from it and be transformed by it. This, of course, isn't without risk. Jesus warns the disciples that they will be handed over, language that he uses to describe his own suffering and death when he says the son of man must be handed over to be crucified. Justice work is cross-shaped work and always carries the risk that the wolves will make you their next meal. Finally, this doesn't mean that the disciples should allow themselves to be manipulated or abused. Jesus gives them clear instructions on how they are to proceed. Beware, be wise, be innocent. In other words, keep your wits about you. Have an escape plan. Do your homework, have a strategy, and be vigilant about your innocence. Don't give your opponents ammunition against you. Don't be tempted to retaliate when they persecute you. Just move on and shake the dust off your feet as you go. This is a master class in nonviolent action. Our job as disciples is not to usher in the kingdom by force, beating the world around us into submission. If our message isn't received, simply keep moving and keep preaching until we find people who will receive it. And the nonviolence is key. In his book, How Nonviolent Struggle Works, Gene Sharp makes this argument. Violence by resistors shifts attention to the violence itself, away from the issues, and away from the courage of the resistors and the opponent's own, usually much greater, violence. Of course, the violence may be a red herring, a smokescreen, a facade created by the opponents to discredit and sabotage the movement. In From Dictatorship to Democracy, Gene Sharp writes, leaders should always be alert for the presence of agents provocateur, whose mission will be to incite the demonstrators to violence. All the more reason 
to be wise, beware, be innocent. We are not even halfway through 2020, and already this year feels like the longest decade ever. Humanity seems to be struggling with one crisis after another. While we were preoccupied with a global pandemic, George Floyd's death sparked riots and protests around the world. You've probably forgotten about the opioid crisis, but that continues to remain a major public health crisis in our country. Experts predict we'll see a housing market recession and a global financial crisis yet this year. And we, as the United States, are heading into a presidential election as a nation more divided now than perhaps at any point since 1860. Now, more than ever, we are harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And we are also the wolves, the rioters and looters, the people who refuse to believe that racism and white supremacy exist, the people engaging in brutality, the silent enablers of all of these problems, and those who get caught up in dehumanizing all of the above. Still, we are called and sent to preach the good news, to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, both within and without. Some of the people we encounter will be worthy of our peace. Some will not, and that's okay. Shake the dust off your feet as you go, and always beware, be wise, be innocent. Some will hand you over to the authorities. Some will beat you. Some will make examples out of you. Some will kill you. Your friends, siblings, parents, children will betray you, hate you. Jesus says, expect it. This is what happens when the kingdom breaks into the world, threatening those in power. And still, we are called and sent. So go, preach the good news. Cure the sick that our society might stop managing symptoms and finally heal. Raise the dead that their witness to injustice may shine brightly in us all. Cleanse the lepers that the outcasts of this world may finally be seen for who they are, worthy of love and belonging. And cast out demons that the forces of white supremacy may no longer have power over us. Amen.
Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Save us, O God, from ourselves, from racism often cloaked in pious words, from the machinations of white supremacy hidden in calls for civility, from microaggressions thinly veiled in arrogance, from apologies when they don't give way to action, from forgiveness without facing the truth, from reconciliation without reparation. Deliver us, O oh God, from expected sib expecting siblings of color to continue to bear this emotional work, which is not theirs to do. Grateful for the long arc that bends towards justice, we pray, grant us wisdom, Give us courage for the facing of these days by the power of the Spirit, all for the sake of the kingdom that we share in Christ Jesus. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Come wherever the coronavirus has struck, O oh compassionate God. Be present to all whom mourn their death, all who have been, con who all, all who have contracted the virus, those who are quarantined or stranded away from home, those who have lost employment, children who cannot assemble for school and parents with needs for child care. Visit phys physicians, nurses, and home health aides, hospitals and clinics, medical researchers, and the Centers for Disease Control. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Come to all in need, O oh healing God. Unbind who are held captive by anxiety, despair, or pain. Comfort those around the world who cannot bury their dead. House the homeless in safe places. Show us how to provide some assistance to those who suffer. Accompany those who seek care in overwhelmed hospitals and clinics. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. And we pray specifically for Mount Olive members and friends who are ill, grieving, or recovering from injury. Those sick, recovering, anxious, homebound, or grieving because of COVID-19. And all homebound members. We also pray that the good news of Christ's death and resurrection might be proclaimed through, the compa through our companion congregations in Kajota, Tanzania and Bogota, Colombia. Grant that their good works might shine in the darkness, bringing glory to God and blessing to all. Sustain us in your mission until that day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those who too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. Please share words of God's peace with one another. Let us pray. Gracious God, you reveal you your son to us in word and sacrament. Open, open our, our hearts, hearts to receive him now. As, as the scriptures are proclaimed and the meal is shared, grant, grant us to see and know the presence of Jesus Christ, Christ our Savior and Lord. Lord. Amen. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, 
that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Gathered at the Lord's table and around our own, we remember with thanksgiving that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. With all your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, your be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will, will be done, done on earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us today our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. Save, save us from the time of trial and deliver, and deliver us from evil. evil. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Amen. Friends of Jesus, come to the table. Receive nourishment for your journey. And now those of you who are worshiping with another today, I invite you to turn to them and take the bread or cracker and say to them, the body of Christ given for you. And also the wine or juice saying to them, the blood of Christ shed for you. And for those of you who are worshiping by yourself today, please take the bread or cracker. It is the body of Christ given for you. And then the wine or juice. It is the blood of Christ shed for you. Travis, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Glenn, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth, sustained by these gifts, so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. i
Peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.